This is the Saponi tribe's religion, as recorded from history, of the dividing line Colonel William Byrd diary entries for October 7 to 13, 1728, October 7, 1728 our men killed a very fat buck and several turkeys. These two kinds of meat boiled together, with the addition of a little rice or French barley, made excellent soup, and what happens rarely in other good things, it never cloyed, no more than an engaging wife would do, by being a constant dish. Our Indian was very superstitious in this matter, and told us, with a face full of concern, that if we continued to boil venison and turkey together we should for the future kill nothing, because the spirit that presided over the woods would drive all the game out of our sight. But we had the happiness to find this an ideal superstition, and though his argument could not convince us, yet our repeated experience at last, with much ado, convinced him. October 13, 1728 This being Sunday, we rested from our fatigue and had leisure to reflect on the signal mercies of Providence. The great plenty of meat wherewith bearskin furnished us in these lonely woods made us once more shorten the men's allowance of bread from five to four pounds of biscuit a week. This was the more necessary because we knew not yet how long our business might require us to be out. In the afternoon our hunters went forth and returned triumphantly with three brace of wild turkeys. They told us they could see mountains distinctly from every eminence though the atmosphere was so thick with smoke that they appeared at a greater distance than they really were. In the evening we examined our friend Bearskin concerning the religion of his country and he explained it to us without any of that reserve to which his nation is subject. He told us he believed there was one supreme God who had several subaltern deities under him, and that this master God made the world a long time ago. That he told the sun, the moon, and stars their business in the beginning, which they, with good looking, after, have faithfully performed ever since. That the same power that made all things at first has taken care to keep them in the same method and motion ever since. He believed that God had formed many worlds before he formed this, but that those worlds either grew old and ruinous or were destroyed for the dishonesty of the inhabitants. That God is very just and very good, ever well pleased with those men who possess those God-like qualities. That he takes good people into his safe protection, makes them very rich, fills their bellies plentifully, preserves them from sickness and from being surprised or overcome by their enemies but all such as tell lies and cheat those they have dealings with he never fails to punish with sickness, poverty and hunger and after all that suffers them to be knocked on the head and scalped by those that fight against them. He believed that after death both good and bad people are conducted by a strong guard into a great road in which departed souls travel together for some time till at a certain distance this road forks into two paths, the one extremely level and the other stony and mountainous. Here the good are parted from the bad by a flash of lightning, the first being hurried away to the right, the other to the left. The right-hand road leads to a charming, warm country where the spring is everlasting, and every month is May, and as the year is always in its youth, so are the people, and particularly the women are bright as stars and never scold. That in this happy climate there are deer, turkeys, elks, and buffaloes innumerable perpetually fat and gentle, while the trees are loaded with delicious fruit quite throughout the four seasons. That the soil brings forth corn spontaneously, without the curse of labor, and so very wholesome that none who have the happiness to eat of it are ever sick, grow old, or die. Near the entrance into this blessed land sits a venerable old man on a mat richly woven, who examines strictly all that are brought before him, and if they have behaved well, the guards are ordered to open the crystal gate and let them enter into the land of delight. The left-hand path is very rugged and uneven leading to a dark and barren country where it is always winter. The ground is the whole year round covered with snow, and nothing is to be seen upon the trees but icicles. All the people are hungry, yet have not a morsel of anything to eat except a bitter kind of potato that gives them the dry gripes and fills their whole body with loathsome ulcers that stink and are insupportably painful. Here all the women are old and ugly, having claws like a panther with which they fly upon the men that slight their passion. For it seems these haggard old furies are intolerably fond and expect a vast deal of cherishing. They talk much, and exceedingly shrill, giving exquisite pain to the drum of the ear, which in that place of the torment is so tender that every sharp note wounds it to the quick. At the end of this path sits a dreadful old woman on a monstrous toadstool, 
whose head is covered with rattlesnakes instead of tresses, with glaring white eyes, that strike a terror unspeakable into all that behold her. This hag pronounces sentence of woe upon all the miserable wretches that hold up their hands at her tribunal. After this they are delivered over to huge turkey buzzards, like harpies, that fly away with them to the place above, mentioned. Here, after they have been tormented a certain number of years according to their several degrees of guilt, they are driven back into this world, to try if they will mend their manners and merit that place the next time, in the regions of bliss this was the substance of Erskine's religion, and was as much to the purpose as could be expected from a mere state of nature without one glimpse of revelation or philosophy. It contained, however, the three great articles of natural religion, the belief of a god, the moral distinction betwixt good and evil, and the expectation of rewards and punishments in another world. Indeed, the Indian notion of a future happiness is a little gross and sensual, like Muhammad's paradise. But how can it be otherwise in a people that are contented with nature as they find her, and have no other lights but what they receive from her blind tradition?